Alrighty, we'll go ahead and get started with the next lecture. This one's going to be on OB Doppler, looking at both the spectral and the color flow, how it can help us when we should use it. So we're going to review some of the technical components for the proper Doppler acquisition, looking at proper angle of incination, when to use angle correct, when you need to use it, when you don't, looking at your gate size and position, and then describing the normal and abnormal waveforms of the ductus venosus, the mid-cerebral artery, the umbilical artery, umbilical vein, and then the uterine artery. So what is the clinical usefulness of the obstetrical Doppler? How can it help me? Well, we do all of this to try to prevent adverse perinatal outcome. So let's think about this. So how? We're looking at the technical component, how to optimize your Doppler, what's going to give me a good Doppler image, what's not. Why? What information am I trying to obtain? How is it going to help me? And then when, at what gestational age, should Doppler be performed? And when does it benefit the patient care and help with my outcomes? I'll just go over some basic physics stuff first. So first, you want to confirm the fetal heart. Make sure that there is a nice heartbeat. If you're looking for cardiac activity, you document with M mode or video clip. You want to use ALARA principle, so as low as reasonably achievable. So please try to use M mode rather than the Doppler on the heart, especially in the first trimester. And things to remember is that Doppler compliance, don't use Doppler to obtain heart rate unless you're unable to see it with the M mode because Doppler has a higher energy output and acoustic intensity. So you want to uh, be mindful of your thermal index. Uh, in the first trimester, we should be using TIS and in the second, third trimester, TIB. So thermal index and soft tissues thermal index and bone, and it's on your machines, all those little things that are listed on your machine as to what the uh, mechanical index or the thermal index is are all listed on your machine. So follow the Alara principle. What gestational age of the fetus? Less than 10 weeks, no spectral Doppler, only if there's something that you need to obtain. So always try to go with your uh, M mode first. So what can my Doppler tell me? Well, it can tell me is there flow in a vessel or organ? And you can use spectral and color flow to evaluate that. It tells me with the vascular flow, what is the vascular before or after a valve or through a vessel. Know the ranges. We want to look at the directional flow through the vessel and organ. Once you have your orientation set up in your mind, you should know which way that blood should be moving through that vessel. So this, the color will help us identify if the flow is through the part or the vessel that we're looking at. Is it moving in the proper direction? It can also help us to assess for any restriction to flow through a vessel or an organ can help us with our twin assessment, especially with your monochorionic twins. So your monochorionic twins, almost they're going to have some type of vessel sharing. It's whether they share a, a normal amount or an abnormal amount. And do they share an equal amount of vessels? So in about 20, 15 to 20 percent of your monochorionic twins can develop a problem with unequal sharing of that placenta. So it helps us to identify twin-to-twin -to -twin transfusion syndrome, which is the polyhydramnios oligohydramnios sequence, where one baby has too much fluid and one has too little, versus the selective growth restriction. Because you can have just with the placenta, that this one baby has a smaller part of the placenta, but they're still going to have a normal stomach, normal bladder. So it helps us to define which baby has the twin-to-twin, -twin, which pregnancy has twin-to-twin, -twin, and which one is just a selective IUGR in a multiple gestation. And we do that by assessing the fluids, and assessing the Doppler. So the Doppler is going to reflect blood velocity. It gets information about the blood flow, the presence of flow, the direction of that blood flow, the velocity of the blood flow, the volume, and then the impedance. So all of these different things that we're looking at is all based upon the characteristics of the maximum frequency shifts in the envelope. So when we're looking at the peak, that's the highest of the systolic value. Then we're looking at the end diastole, which is D, and then the temporal average frequency, which is your A. So these are the three main components that we're going to look at. These three values are used to develop the indices that we measure, the pulsatility of the Doppler waveform, and it reflects your dynamic change in circulation through a cardiac cycle. So the systolic is the peak, diastolic is the end, and then the temporal average is the average over the frequency shift over one cardiac cycle. So that's where we're getting these numbers from. So you're getting your SD ratio is the difference between the peak systole and the end diastole. And we're looking at the pulsatility index and the resistive index. And then your, um, your max heart rate. All of that is going to be calculated when you're doing your Doppler. So your Doppler index, or DI, 
is calculated as a ratio. It's independent of angle, so no angle correct is needed when you're doing this. You still want to try to keep your angle of incination, how you're obtaining that Doppler, as that angle, the closer you can get to zero, the better. The most common OB Doppler indices that we're going to look at is the SD ratio, which is looking at peak systole frequency shift to the end diastolic frequency shift. The resistive index, which and how we get that is taking the S minus the D divided by the S. And then the pulsatility index, which is S minus D divided by A. So, I mean, you have to understand these basic principles so that we can move forward so you understand your Doppler. So you want to place your Doppler gate parallel to flow whenever possible and in the middle of the vessel because the closer you get to the wall, the more artifact you're going to get from the wall. So what can the abnormal Doppler values in the umbilical artery tell us? Well, it reflects placental function or dysfunction. It can be seen in association with growth restriction. It can be seen in association with aneuploidy, with karyotype uh, abnormalities. And extremely abnormal findings can precede uh, fetal death or abnormal heart rate tracing. So even before the baby starts to show abnormalities in the heart rate tracing that you get with your NST, the Doppler can let us know that the baby's starting to get into trouble before it's reflected in the heart rate tracings. So and then it reflects cardiac arrhythmias. What's happening in the heart is reflected in parts of the fetal circulation, just like we showed yesterday, where when you have that arrhythmia and if you're having a hard time seeing it on your M mode, do a Doppler of the umbilical artery and you'll see that what's happening in the heart is reflected in the umbilical artery Doppler. So when we talk about the cardiac cycle, we're talking about systole and diastole. So systole is the drawing together, the contraction or ejection period, and the diastole is the drawing asunder or the period of uh, dilatation, and that's when it's filling. So contracting is moving the blood out, and then in diastole is the filling cycle. And remember when we're talking about the cardiac cycle, uh, systole and di diastole, we're talking about the ventricular phase of that. So PR intervals, one of the things that we'll look at, this helps to assess fetuses that may be at risk for congenital heart block. So when you have antibodies maybe found in women with uh, systemic lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren's syndrome, so your SSA, SSB antibodies, some of your other autoimmune diseases, and then sometimes asymptomatic intervals. And this is that document in case you wanted to pull it up and look at it. It's a good reference to have in your lab. So to evaluate your PR intervals, you, you measure it with a pulse, Doppler waveform may help to predict fetuses that may be at risk for a congenital heart block. You're looking at the contraction phase of the ventricle. You're placing your Doppler right in the left ventricle near the mitral aortic region, and you're obtaining both the inflow and outflow information from that left ventricle. Your upper cutoff that you can use is 140 milliseconds. And there's recent studies now that are saying it really isn't as predictive as we thought for heart block. And then the treatment of that is a little controversial too. So it'll be more for us to follow as we get more studies done. But this is looking at that PR interval. What are we looking at? We're looking at the heart rate, but we're actually looking at the inflow, onset of the atrial contraction, which is your A wave, and to the onset of your ventricular contraction, which is your V wave. So we're going to monitor this starting at about 16 weeks all the way up to about 36 weeks. And again, should be below 140. Usually it sits around 120 plus or minus uh, 10 to 20 beats per minute. So the E, you got your EA wave of the mitral valve, and then the V is the aortic kick as the blood's being pumped out of the left ventricle through the aorta. So we're sampling the site at the mitral aortic continuity, so right at the, the aortic root near the interventricular septum, so we're getting both the inflow and the outflow, and that's what we're looking at. What is the time from where the blood comes in the blood's going out. So we're going to go here to the EA wave, and then we're going to measure from the EA wave here over to when the, uh, the aorta, the blood is being pushed out through the aorta. And that's what we're looking at is that time interval. So once you get used to doing them, I mean, it's not that hard. It's just, you know, putting your gate in the proper place where you're getting both a good inflow and an outflow. Okay, what can affect your Doppler waveform? Well, fetal breathing, baby's moving. So you have to try to wait. If the baby's doing a lot of the practice breathing, go ahead and do your measurements and then come back. Because when they're doing a lot of breathing, then it's very hard for you to get a good Doppler measurement. Uh, cardiac factors, so an arrhythmia, heart defects, any of those things that can interrupt the blood flow that's going through your uh, umbilical artery. 
maternal breathing. Sometimes, you know, moms are uncomfortable or they're moving around. I mean, so you, sometimes you have to roll them on their side, try to make them as comfortable as possible. Sometimes you have to ask them to hold their breath because they're breathing so fast that it's really interfering with your obtaining of the Doppler waveform. All right, so be aware of these artifacts and that they can or will affect your indices. And what, try to get your Doppler, the best Doppler is going to be during fetal apnea, when that baby's not moving around or doing any of the fetal breathing. So this is when there was hiccups. See it? Look how it drops out here. Well, you don't want to call that, oh, look, there's decreased flow in that umbilical artery. Well, no, the baby had a hiccup. And you can see it's reflected in all of the waveforms. Look at here, even with the MCA. Going along fine, and all of a sudden a big dropout. So be aware that these different things, the breathing hiccups, can affect what you're seeing on your Doppler. Other things that can affect the Doppler assessment, the fetal breathing, look at here. Look at how it's going up and down, up and down. That baby is just doing rapid breathing movements right now. So you want to wait till there's apnea so you can get a nice tracing on there. You don't want to be tracing all of these. Look at those up and down. So cardiac factors, again, affect acceleration of blood and systole. The contractility of the heart affects peak velocity. So arrhythmias, SVTs, dysfunction, any of those can affect your Doppler assessment. So just be aware of them. So it's just like we did the M mode through the heart. We can see it's reflected in what we see in the Doppler. So what affects your Doppler analysis? Well, it's affected by the size of the color box. You don't want it too big. You want it just big enough to cover the information of what are you trying to obtain? What are you trying to measure at this time? So the smaller the box size, the more information in that one area, it's going to give you a better uh, look. The velocity range, the wall filter, persistence, color gain, color line density, location of your sample, and then the angle of incination. So color Doppler, where is it going to add? It's going to add blood flow information. What is the perfusion? Is there uh, any type of a narrowing or stenosis? The direction and detectional flow? Is it anti-grade flow, retrograde flow, bi-directional? Is it going back and forth? Is there any turbulence? Is there any shunting? It helps us demonstrate small vessels that we can't see very well, put on the color, and then decrease your scale so that you're allowing more color so you can see some of the flow in the smaller vessels. So especially like for your Venus, you want to go ahead and uh, decrease your scale. And then helps it. The color also helps us know where we're going to place our spectral Doppler gate. So if you're having a hard time, like for especially when you're looking for the ductus spinosus, turn up your overall color gains, look for the area of turbulence, and that's your ductus spinosus coming right off the umbilical vein. So sometimes it can help us is to know exactly where do we want to put that Doppler gate so it makes it easier for us to obtain the waveform that we're trying to get. It also helps us to identify these abnormal cord insertion sites in the placenta. How many people are looking for cord insertion into the placenta? Yeah, if you're not, you should, because of, if you miss one vas previa, that's catastrophic to both the patient and the mom. So, and unless you start looking for these cord inserts, you're going to miss some of these. I mean, this one, if it's a velamentous cord insert and it's up in the fundus, that's wonderful. What if this is down in the lower uterine segment? And you've got these vessels that are coming and branching. Now you've got these vessels over the, uh, the cervix and nobody you know, looked at it because the placenta is away from it. Because you remember the cord insert is showing us the original implantation site. It's showing us where that blastocyst came in and established that early network with the endometrium. So now if there's good blood supply, wherever there's good blood supply, then you're going to have the chorionic villi, the placenta continues to grow. Where there's not good blood supply, it starts to atrophy. Well, the cord insert can't move. If there was it implanted low or high and there's not good blood supply there, well, then that starts to atrophy. Well, the cord insertion can't move, but it's, the chorionic villi is going to continue to grow where there's good perfusion. So now your placenta is way up here, but your cord insert is here, and now these vessels have to travel through the amnion over to the placenta. So it makes it more vulnerable when it's at that velamentous cord insert. But if you're not looking for the placental cord insert, you're going to miss these. And plus, you know, if you have a velamentous cord insert, it's nice to let your obstetrician know so when they deliver, they're not yanking on that cord trying to get the placenta to come off. All right? So color really is very helpful for trying to see that because sometimes you just can't see it with just your 2D. So it really does help with that. So optimize your color image. Know your equipment. What steps do I need to do to change the size of the box, uh, changing the, the size of the image? Like we talked about yesterday, changing your sector width, how it can increase your frame rate. Because if your sector width is open like this, there's only so many lines of information. The further it's spread out, 
the bigger the gaps in between those lines. If you take it like an accordion and compress it, now you've got more information, you know, you have less space in between your lines of information, so you're actually getting more information in that space. So, smaller size gives a higher frame rate. Anytime that higher frame rate's given us a better image. The velocity scalar PRF, increase your PRF is gonna clean up your image, so you're gonna use a higher PRF when you're looking at high flow. So when you're looking at the heart, Usual range for great arteries is going to be 45 to 60 centimeters per second. And then when we go to the venous, then you want to drop it down to 10 to 20. Those at least are ballpark, and then you're going to adjust it depending about the patient, the patient size, the fetal position. I mean, you're always adjusting this to try to optimize your image depending upon what you're looking at at that time. Your wall filter helps you eliminate signals from wall motion. So this is uh, very important when we're looking at the heart. So you can use a high filter for the heart and the great arteries, and a low filter when we're looking at the pulmonary arteries and veins. Again, because we don't have to worry about a lot of wall motion there, but we want to see more flow. Persistence is when there's an overlap of information from prior images. And for cardiac, we want that low. We don't want a lot of overlap from the prior images. So we want to have our settings at low for the persistence. So we're going to adjust our image. First thing you want to do is adjust the depth. Make sure that you're just penetrating to the area that you're trying to evaluate at that time. Change your sector width. Once you change your sector width, then you're going to magnify or zoom, and then change your sweep speed if you need to. So some of the other technical components, is you're going to identify the vessel to be sampled, use color for the easier assessment and placement of your gate, zoom it, check your angle of incination, your sample site, make sure your sample site and your gate is appropriate for what you're trying to sample. You want to make sure that you're not outside the vessel, you're within the vessel. And then your Doppler settings, adjusting your sweep and your scale. I'll go through each of these. So looking at this sweep versus this one. Do you see I have a lot here, but do I really need all of these? Look how much more information I can get by just adjusting the sweep speed and the scale. I only need three or four of these to get more information when it's smaller like this, I guess as I'm getting older, I'm like, okay, you know, supersize that. I want to see as much information as I can from that waveform. I don't need to see 10 of them. I want to see, you know, three to four good so I can see the detail on that a little bit. All right. And same thing with this one. Again, just changing how fast, you know, the scale size and the sweep speed. So a lot of times they'll come up on um, low or medium, so you're getting like 10 or 12 of them. Adjust it to fast. I mean, I, don't, I rarely use max, but I mean, I use fast, the fast sweep speed a lot. Okay, so what do you think is wrong with this one? This is looking at a cross-section of the baby's head. We're trying to look at the mid-cerebral artery. So what are a couple of things that you can see that's wrong with this image? Well, number one, look how small this is. Do I really need to see all of this? Well, the first thing I would do is change my depth, change my sector width, Change my magnification, so I'm looking at just the head. And then when we look over here, look at the angle. 22 degrees. Angle correct on that. Should we ever be more than 10 degrees on angle correct for MCA? No. So garbage in, garbage out. If you're not using the proper image optimization, you're not going to get good information back. So you want to change your sector width, the depth, the focal zone. Make sure what you're looking at is at the center. You move your focal zone to the center of what you're trying to look at. Increase your frame rate, which will give you a better resolution for the waveform. Decrease your PRF is going to give you a bigger waveform. To evaluate a stenosis, so what, I, what am I trying to look for? If I'm trying to look for insufficiency versus a stenosis. So if I'm looking for a stenosis, place your Doppler gate distal to the valve or area of interest, and if you're looking for insufficiency, then you're looking, putting your Doppler gate proximal to the valve. So what information am I trying to get? It tells you where you need to place your gate. So think about this. What am I looking for? What am I trying to understand? So looking at the angle of flow for the umbilical artery Doppler, that Doppler angle should always be less than 60. Best tracing obtained when the flow is parallel. So again, anytime you can get the Doppler gate parallel to flow with an angle of incination of zero, that's always going to give you the best information. Now, do we need to use angle correct on the umbilical artery Doppler? No. The only one you need to use angle correct on is going to be your MCA because you're looking for the peak systolic value on that, and we'll go over that. So with the umbilical artery, remember that 
The best tracing is going to be in the middle of the cord because if you have, if you're closer to the placenta, then you can artificially get reassured that those vessels are bigger as they're coming into the placenta. So they're going to be more normal. And if you get too close to the fetal abdomen, they're going to be artificially higher. So we're looking for the average of flow through that umbilical cord. So try to do mid cord. And we do uh, two to three different sites. And if you have, there's two arteries, if one artery looks like there's increased resistance, make sure you sample the other artery. Look at both of them. All right. So you're going to place your Doppler cursor. You always put your color on and then try to place your gate in the middle of the artery. And the normal placenta should have low resistance to flow, allowing for forward flow in the umbilical arteries throughout the cardiac cycle, even through diastole. So we want to see this nice high flow in diastole. We should always have high forward flow. Remember that your SD ratio is gestational age dependent. It's going to decrease with increasing gestational age. So the further you get into the pregnancy, the lower that range should be. So from 18, these are just guidelines now. So 18 to 20 weeks, 95th percentile is going to be about 7. When you get to 21 weeks, the 95th percentile is about 6, decreasing to about 4 and at about 30 weeks. And then after 34 weeks, it should be usually below 3. But, you know, they, they have these charts. They're everywhere. You can go to perinatology.com. You put in the gestational age. You put on calculator, and it'll tell you what the normal ranges are. All right? So just be aware that it does change over gestational age. Sample of site may affect the cord indices. Higher resistance near the fetal abdomen. Lower resistance near the placenta. And so you want to just make sure that you are doing the mid-cord and... Um, Try to do at least two or three to get an average. Where are the uh, values that we're looking at? So here's my nice tracing. So I've changed my sweep speed. I've changed my scale. I have at least a couple good images here where I'm just trying to evaluate this Doppler waveform. I'm looking at the SD ratio, which was 2.7. I'm looking at the pulsatility index, which was 1.0. And then looking at the resistive index. So after 18 weeks, the normal umbilical artery PI should always be greater than 1. So when is the umbilical artery Doppler abnormal? Well, when it's above the 95th percentile, so that's why it's important for you to know the gestational age and compare it to what the SD ratio is. Anytime the diastolic flow is absent after 18 to 20 weeks, and then if diastolic flow is reversed after 18 to 20 weeks. Any of those scenarios, then that's abnormal. And this is from Dr. Gaziano, one of the godfathers of Doppler. I actually had the pleasure of working with him for a number of years. So these are the different waveforms. So looking at good flow in diastole, now we've got increased resistance to flow, and then we have a reverse flow. So that's what we're trying to look for. What is the flow through that vessel at that point in time? Best waveform, again, obtained with uh, being parallel to the vessels. And if you have an abnormality or increased resistance to flow in one of the arteries, make sure you check the other artery. Okay, so when we're looking at this one, this baby started to fall off on the growth curve. It wasn't IUGR yet, but it was a small for gestational age. So one of the things that we added, because even though the estimated fetal weight was uh, like at the 11th or 12th percentile, the AC was less than the 10th percentile. So then we went ahead and did the Dopplers, and we could see there was increased SD ratio here. It was 4.33. So absent or reverse end diastolic flow. When you have reverse end diastolic flow, it increases your perinatal uh, mortality by about 80%. So it's giving us information, letting us know when this baby is getting into trouble. So umbilical Doppler significantly reduces your babies that end up with a third trimester loss. So it's letting us know. It's like walking a tightrope. This baby's at risk. When do we allow them to go on? Or when is it time to say, okay, it's time to deliver? So again, it's giving us more information, and it's before you start to see changes in your NST. So including your Dopplers in your evaluation is going to reduce your risk for perinatal death by 38%. So, I mean, that's huge. I mean, if you can increase your good outcomes by 38% by just doing a Doppler, that's fantastic. So absent end diastolic flow. I just encourage you that if you do suspect absent end diastolic flow, then try to get the artery separate from the umbilical vein because sometimes it could be reverse and you're missing it because you've got the artery and the vein on top of each other. So try to sample the artery separate from the vein. So remember to check your wall filter. If it's set too high, you can miss reverse flow because you're filtering that out. So check your wall filter. And this is actually a reverse end diastolic flow. 
So you can see how it's actually coming below the baseline. So fetus with a growth delay and oligohydramnios, you should be doing those Dopplers. And you can see, I mean, look how poor that image is there because the first thing that happens when you don't have fluid is it's harder for you to see everything. So that's really when your color uh, flow really comes in to help you identify it because, I mean, you can't even see where, where was the umbilical cord without the color. It was very difficult to see. So this is reverse and diastolic flow. Again, then I just changed the scale a little bit. So again, you can see that. So make sure that you're, you don't have the umbilical vein underneath. I know we used to try to get both the artery and the vein on one image so we could look at both of them on one image. But if you do that, sometimes you're going to miss this reverse end diastolic flow because you've got your venous flow underneath there. All right, so moving on to the mid cerebral artery. And this slide's from uh, Dr. Gaziano. It's an important vessel. It reflects uh, the fetal adaptation to fetal hypoxia. It correlates well with fetal anemia. And what we're looking at here is the peak systolic value, so the peak MCA systolic velocity, and we express that in centimeters per second. It may be difficult to evaluate secondary to the small vessel side, especially when you're uh, looking at you know, 16, 17 weeks and some of these early twin to twins, and because of the fetal position. But remember, if you cannot obtain the MCA Doppler using the proper guidelines and meeting that criteria, then do not measure it because then you're giving them false information. So the mid-cerebral arteries, if compromised, the fetus automatically shunts blood up to the brain, and that's called the brain sparing effect, where it's a baby automatically will do that. So it helps for us to assess blood redistribution in um, IUGR, fetal anemias, and the anemia can be from atypical antibodies, heart failure, twin to twin, some of your parvovirus, high drops, fetal vascular tumors, and polyhydramnios, so anything that can cause anemia to the baby. So this is our best way to try to assess that. And then blood redistribution and your multiple gestations. So when we talk about twin to twin, there's actually two different types of this eye redistribution. It can be called TOPS. This is the one that most people know, which is characterized by the twin oligohydramnios polyhydramnios sequence. It's asymmetric fluid distribution and growth. You have oligohydramnios in your donor twin. It's pumping some of its blood over to the other baby. And then your recipient has polyhydramnios because it's got volume overload. So it's trying to pee, trying to get rid of some of this volume. So you get too much fluid in one sac and not enough fluid in the other. It only affects about 9 to 10% of your monochorionic twins because there's an unbalanced intertwin blood transfusion. And this is our best known clinical syndrome for our twin, monochorionic twins. One of the other things you can see is uh, TAPS, which is a twin anemia polycythemia sequence. And so what this is looking at is characterized by a large intertwin hemoglobin difference in the absence of amniotic fluid discordance. So your amniotic fluids on both sides are very, you know, close. One could be 5 and one could be 3.5. So you don't have the poly -Oli syndrome going on. You have normal bladders, you have normal stomachs, you have normal amniotic fluid, but you can still have a discordance in what their MCA is doing. So it may occur spontaneously in about just 5% of your monochorionic uh, pregnancies. And we really started following this up is after we started doing the laser treatment because look, it goes to 2 to 13% post laser ablation treatment for your TTTS. So now we're following these a lot more carefully. So a lot of times if we're doing these twin to twins, we're not even looking at the umbilical artery anymore. The main thing we're looking at is we're looking at the ductus venosus and looking at the MCA. The MCA is letting us know when those babies are starting to run into trouble. Okay, it was first described in 2007. So you have few small anastomoses. So you have a slow transfusion from the donor to the recipient. There's no hormonal imbalance and you have an absence of the amniotic fluid discordance. So the discordance is all in the uh, peak MCA Doppler. So your donor is going to have an increased MCA greater than 1.5 MOMs, which is suggestive of, ane of anemia, and then your recipient has a decreased MCA, so less than uh, 0 0.8. Some places will use even 1.0 as their cutoff, so, and that's suggestive of polycythemia. So this is what we're looking at is discordance in the MCA. So these babies can be very sick, and if you're not doing an MCA Doppler, you're going to miss this. So what we're going to do is we're going to magnify when we're looking at the MCA. We're magnifying up the head. I'm looking just at the circle of willis. I'm using the color to help tell me where I'm going to put my uh, Doppler gate. 
I'm looking at the circle of Willis, and this is the mid cerebral artery coming up here. I try to get that angle of incination as close to zero as possible. If I can't, then I can do my angle correct, you know, depending on how the baby's laying, uh, but it'll be plus or minus 10 degrees either way. But the closer you can get it to straight up and down, the better it's going to be. So you magnify your image, place your Doppler gate, usually within the first two to three millimeters as it's coming off the circle. So you need to see the circle of Willis within the first two to three millimeters of it coming off the circle of Willis. That's where you're going to put your gate. Because as you get further and further out into the vessel, well, what happens? That vessel is getting smaller and smaller. So, of course, the peak MCA is going to be a little bit higher when you're further out away from the circle of Willis. So where am I putting my gate? What is my angle of incination? And then you want to keep your gate at about 2 millimeters. All right. If you have to use angle correct, you want to try to get as parallel flow as possible. And your angle correct should always be less than 10 degrees. Very, very important. Incorrect angle of incination is going to give us wrong information. I mean, if you're coming from over here, look at, and there's no way that's even close to 10 degrees from how that blood is flowing. So you need to roll your patient, change your angle of incination, move over to the other side of the abdomen. You have to be able to get a good angle of incination on that mid cerebral artery. And if you can't, then put down unable to obtain MCA Doppler secondary to position. I mean, if the baby is laying with the face down, you're probably not going to get a good MCA Doppler. So, I mean, you have to roll mom, see if you can get that baby to move. If you can't get it in the beginning of the scan, then recheck, you know, and if the baby finally moves, then go ahead and grab it. It's just like when you're doing fetal hearts. Anytime that baby's chest turns up, stop everything else and do the heart. Same thing when you're doing your Dopplers. If that baby moves that head to a nice axial transverse section, then go ahead and stop everything else and get your MCE Dopplers if you're going to need Dopplers with that scan. All right. So the peak systolic velocity correlates with your fetal anemia and may be useful in fetal growth restriction. So again, looking at the MCA, looking at our circle of Willis, uh, normal peak systolic value should be below 50 centimeters per second in the gestational age, less than 32 weeks. So that's just a good rule of thumb. But of course, you're going to take that value. You're always going to take the highest. Even if you do two or three measurements, you're taking your highest value. You go to perinatology.com. You go under uh, your peak MCA values and put in the gestational age, and it'll tell you how many multiples of the mean it is. That is the easiest way to do it instead of having to run and look for a chart. Oh, what chart are we using? When has it been revised? That website gets updated more frequently than anything else. So please, 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 it's free. Everybody use that. All right, so an elevated MCA is when we were looking, look at this is 70.69. But again, they're gestational age dependent, so you need to know what the gestational age is. All right, so you put in the gestational age. Let's look at B was at 41.26, and then A was 70.69. So when to measure the MCA? Measure weekly in a fetus at risk for fetal anemia. Whatever the risk is, if they're at risk for fetal anemia, you want to check that weekly. If the value is greater than 1.5 MOMs, multiples of the means, they may need fetal blood sampling. So that's what we're trying to do. We used to draw amniotic fluid off every week or two and send it off for analysis to see if this baby was anemic. So now, I mean, we're actually using the Doppler to try to, you know, prevent a lot of those invasive procedures, trying to monitor them with just the peak MCA. If the peak MCA is uh, less than 1.5, then you use that regression slope to determine the frequency of what, you know, how often do I need to recheck this, but you, we're usually doing them at least once a week. And there's that article that this all came from. I always try to put those on there so you can look them up. And then these, this is looking at the chart. Again, Peak systolic value greater than 1.5 associated with a high risk. Again, it's not telling you for sure the baby's anemic because it's telling you it has a high risk for fetal anemia. And then less than 1.5 associated with mild anemia or no anemia. And that they are gestational age dependent. And here's that website, www.perinatology.com. You go on there, go under calc, and then it'll say uh, MCA peak systolic value. Gestational age, put in your value, and it spits out the MOMs. You can print it up. Attach it right to your report. So an abnormal MCA. When your MCA starts to look like your umbilical, you've got a bad MCA. You should not have this much increased flow. This is when you have increased diastolic flow. That baby is shunting blood up to the brain to keep the brain going. Look at this. This is 80.53. Look how high that is. But look how, how much we're magnifying up. Again, 
You want to zoom up to the area of interest. I'm trying to get as much information as I can. It doesn't mean no good to see the whole baby and have just a little head there. Magnify it up to what you're looking at, what you're trying to evaluate at that time. So yeah, this peak MC was 80.54. No way, shape, or form is that going to be normal. Okay, so what's wrong with this one? Looks, oh yeah, the peak systolic is 15. Well, you know, I'm telling you, if your peak peak MCA is below 20, 25, you probably do not have the correct angle on there. I mean, look at the angle here. Look at, look at the angle correct. So just looking at these, you can tell this is not in a good placement. The ultrasound probe is coming in from here, but look at the angle correct here. So this is, you've got to roll that patient. You've got to get a better angle on that. That angle of incination has to be better than that. So now we're going to look at the relationship between the MCA Doppler and the umbilical Doppler. What, is it, what can it tell us? What is it yielding us? Well, it can give us some good clinical information. Uh, the ratio between the cerebral and the umbilical artery Doppler, the cerebral artery resistance is normally higher than the umbilical artery resistance. When the cerebral artery resistance is lower, this is telling you that brain sparing has occurred. So you can take your MCA resistive index divided by the RI index. It should always be greater than 1. Normal resistive index ratio is greater than 1. Again, Dr. Gaziano, it's one of the papers that he wrote. So, and, and if you think about it, I mean, you know, if you've got a lot of diastolic flow, if there's less resistance and you've got more flow in the MCA, then yes, you are having reversal of how that waveform should look. So abnormal MCA and abnormal umbilical artery. So look, we have increased flow. This almost looks like an umbilical artery Doppler. Look how much flow is in diastole here. But then when I look at my umbilical artery, Look at the decreased flow. So they're inverse of each other. Then you know that head sparing has occurred. So what you're going to see is you're going to see a decreased flow. You've got blood flow redistribution. You've got decreased flow to the pulmonary visceral musculoskeletal. And you have increased flow to the brain, heart, adrenals, and spleen. So the baby's automatically shunting where it's pumping that blood to. So the brain sparing effect, well, why do we worry about that? Well, because then that means that baby could be hypoxic can get acidemia, and that all leads to an adverse outcome. So that's what we're trying to do is prevent those adverse outcomes. So what other Dopplers can we look at? Well, we can look at the venous. So let's look at IVC and some of the other venous patterns. And this, especially with twins, this may be the best measure of deteriorating cardiac function as the cardiac size and filling pressures increases. So we look at the ductus venosus, we'll look at the IVC, and then the umbilical vein. So these are your normals on this side. And these are the abnormals. With your ductus venosus, you should have your peak levels up here should be greater than 35. And you should not see any reverse flow. Because it's one of those shunts that you should always see forward flow. Because it's the umbilical vein coming in. You've got some of the blood going over into the portal. Through the ductus venosus, it's shunting that blood right back up. It's the most highly oxygenated blood being shunted right back up to the IVC and back up into the heart. And then the station valve takes it from the right atrium and shunts it over to the left atrium. So the venous system, we look at ductus venosus, hepatic veins, portal veins, umbilical vein, and they have uh, characteristic pulsations reflecting what's going on in the central venous pressures. We're looking at the umbilical vein coming in to the left portal vein into the right portal vein. So there's your cross section of your abdomen. And then you always look at where, where the aorta is, should be to the left of the spine, and then the IVC. Fifty percent of the umbilical vein blood is shunted towards the foraminal valley. It ensures that the blood with the higher oxygen saturation goes to the ascending aorta, the coronaries, and the cerebral circulation. So that's as that ductus is coming, taking that more highly oxygenated blood, bringing it right back to the right atrium and getting shunted over to the left side. So it's looking at the anatomy of our ductus venosus again, the umbilical vein coming in. The normal peak should be around 30 to 35 centimeters per second. If less, then you actually may be sampling one of the left hepatics. That's the more common thing that I see is that people are actually in the left hepatic vein. They're not really in the ductus. So don't place your Doppler gate too close to the heart. A uh, greater chance of getting the left hepatic or the IVC. Place your Doppler gate in the area of the highest velocity. So turn up your color. It may not be the best color setting because you want to overcompensate. You want to turn up their overall color gain. And that area of... Um, Increased flow that, of turbulence, that's your ductus venosus. It helps you, again, to know where to place your Doppler gate. 
Okay, the PI after 18 weeks again should be less than one. The RI would have been greater than one, the PI is less than one. If greater than one, that's an early sign of heart compromise or dysfunction. So let's look at this waveform. We're looking at the SD and the A ratio. The S is gonna be the filling of the right atrium during ventricular systole. The D is the filling of the right atrium during ventricular diastole. And then the A is your right atrial contraction. That's your normal waveform. So we look for flow and diastole. And again, that normal PI should be below one. So as we're coming in, we've got our color on. So this is a padded coming in here back to IVC. The umbilical vein was there right here, this area. That is going to be your ductus venosus. It's taking the more highly oxygenated blood from that umbilical vein and shunting that back up into the heart. So you can see as you get closer here, if the baby moves, you know, you set your color and you're putting on your spectral gate, baby moves a little bit, well, it's not very far from that ductus venosus over to the left hepatic. So it's very easy. So that's why you need to look at the levels. What is the, uh, the peak systolic value on that ductus venosus? So again, putting, it doesn't matter if you do it sagittal, transverse, whatever way you can get it. So this is looking at a transverse. There's a spine, anterior abdominal wall. And here we've got the umbilical vein. So I've turned up my color settings. But look, this is telling me exactly where to put my Doppler gate. So it doesn't have to be pretty for this. I want to know where do I need to put my Doppler gate. This is the easiest way to do it. Okay, and so when we look at this, look at here's 30. There's 45, so this is right around 50. That's where that should be when it's a, a nice ductus. You want to see it at least about 30, 35. So that's your normal uh, ductus venosus. Look here, I've really turned up a lot of the gate, and then the baby moved a little bit. But still, it's telling me exactly where I need to put my Doppler gate. So that normal ductus venosus has forward flow during the right atrial contraction. And what we look for is an increase in the PI. So look, now this PI, it's greater than one. It shouldn't be greater than one. Look how you know this is almost coming back down to the baseline. We want to see good flow and diastole through that ductus. Here's a transverse of the abdomen. And it's going to be in your recipient that you start to see these changes. So a little bit of, um, here's the umbilical vein coming in here. This area right here, that's the ductus. So what is the clinical utility of the ductus venosus? Well, reversed A and S way has a high sensitivity of fetal cardiac failure. It can also be associated with placental insufficiency, heart failure associated with high drops, end-stage anemia, and again with our twin to twins, the volume overload that we get with our twin to twin and our recipient twin. Okay, reverse end diastolic flow in uh, ductus, you can have increased resistance to flow in the right atrium. So it's reflecting what's going on in the right atrium because that's where it's dumping into is the right atrium. So it's one of the first Doppler waveforms that will let us know that the heart's starting to run into trouble. And you can see here there's actually, you know, reverse flow there. And looking at the umbilical vein. Well, the umbilical vein, you know, we used to just go to any segment of the cord and look for, you know, the umbilical vein in the cord. Well, now they're saying the, probably the best way for us to look at the umbilical vein is actually those first couple centimeters that it's entering into the abdomen. So you sample at the intra-abdominal segment of the umbilical vein. So you get a transverse of the fetal abdomen. It's midway between the abdominal wall and the ductus venosus. The artifacts, again, are going to be from movement and then the fetal breathing. So you have to wait for the fetal apnea in order to get that because otherwise you can make it look like there's pulsations in the umbilical vein, but it's just fetal breathing. Okay, so we want to just see good forward flow in the umbilical vein. So this is the normal umbilical vein, and then this is where the pulsations. So anytime you have pulsations in the umbilical vein, it's associated with increased central venous pressure, and it can uh, progress from a monophasic to a biphasic to a triphasic pulsation. So it can change over time. So looking at the umbilical vein, so a cross-section of my abdomen. So from the spine, so posterior to anterior, left to right. So the umbilical vein is it's coming right into the abdomen, so right below the skin there within the first, uh, you know, two to five centimeters there, we want to put our Doppler gate. And this is just with breathing. So now you can always make it look abnormal, but this is just fetal breathing. So you have to be aware of that artifact to make sure you're not calling umbilical vein pulsations when it's just from fetal breathing. So some of the clinical utilities for the umbilical vein, it can be associated with severe IEGR, non-immune high drops, again, the twin to twin, fetal arrhythmias, congestive heart failure. When you see the pulsations in the umbilical vein in IUGR, it's associated with a five-fold increase of perinatal mortality. 
So again, it's letting you know this baby is running into trouble quick. All right, so this is how we used to do it with just, you know, looking at the umbilical artery on top, umbilical vein on the bottom. But really, we should be sampling at the abdominal insert. All right, looking at the IVC and the hepatic veins, we're going to look at the S, V, D, and A ratio. They're all explained over here. So the systolic, this is the S is looking at the right atrium during ventricular systole. V is looking at the uh, overfilling just prior to tricuspid opens. D is looking at the filling of the right atrium during ventricular diastole. And then A is looking at the uh, right atrium contraction. So this is a cross-section of the baby's abdomen, and this is looking at those hepatic veins coming back to the IVC. So you can see if you're close, as you get closer to the heart, you have everything, all the confluences of all the hepatic vessels coming together there as the veins are coming back to the IVC. So you can see that very easily you can get uh, one of these hepatic veins and thinking that it's ductus venosus. So you need to make sure that you are further away from the heart and that you are indeed getting the ductus venosus. Uh, so the hepatic veins, the peak velocity flow from the atrial kick should uh, not be more than one third of that of the systolic peak. So I know by this time you're like, I got too much Doppler. <laughs> so be careful though. When you're sampling the ductus venosus, if the baby moves during your Doppler acquisition, you can actually move from the ductus into the left hepatic. So look at your velocity scale. If it's less than 30, reset it do another measurement, make sure you truly are in the ductus. So recheck your sample site. Some of the clinical utility for the IVC, reversal of flow in the IVC during atrial contraction, again, goes along with uh, congestive heart failure. So now we're going to look at the uterine artery. Look at the hair on this kid. It was almost like a helmet. Look at that. I was like, oh my goodness. So what is the clinical utility of looking at the uterine artery? Well, an abnormal uterine artery Doppler is associated with adverse outcomes. It's development of, it could be a precursor to development of preeclampsia, fetal growth restriction, and or perinatal death. So it helps the clinician to develop a plan for follow-up scans. How, many, how often am I going to be looking at this mom? How many times do I need to see her every um, uh, two weeks, four weeks, six weeks? I mean, how often do I need to go ahead and bring that mom in here? So we're looking at the uterine artery as it's coming off the iliac and supplying blood to the uterus. And that's where we're sampling, is right along this uterine artery. And we want to sample, and what we're looking for, it's very basic on this. It's either they have a notch or they don't have a notch. So you sample it as it's crossing the, um, from the iliacs. The normal is going to have a gradual disappearance of the notch, usually by 24 weeks. So if you see a notch prior to 24 weeks, that could just be a variant of normal. But if you see persistence of this little notch, it should be a nice, you know, flow down in diastole to the next systolic peak. If you see this little notch, then that um, gives us a, um, an indication that there may be some problem to the blood flow, the perfusion through that uterus. So, so abnormal is when you have unilateral or bilateral notching, which persists beyond 24 weeks. And make sure that you sample both, both sides, okay, both uterine arteries. Both right and left, document both right and left. So notch again that persists after 25 weeks implies incomplete trophoblastic invasion and may be predictive of preeclampsia and or the process of um, uh, growth restriction in that baby. So umbilical artery Doppler is going to reflect downstream resistance to flow and placental insufficiency. The mid cerebral artery reflects blood redistribution under conditions of stress. So it's important to know what's the inferences from our Doppler. Some of the other inferences is that venous Doppler reflects hemodynamic dysfunction, where your biophysical and your heart rate tracing reflects CNS dysfunction. So there's two different things here. So what the biophysical and the, you know, the NST is showing you versus what the Doppler is. So it's a combination of the two that are actually giving us the best evaluation of that baby. So what we're trying to do is um, make sure that these babies that are at risk for hypoxia that we get them delivered before there's an adverse outcome. So early changes that we see in your growth uh, delayed baby is you're going to see changes in your biometry. They're going to start to measure smaller. So estimated fetal weight less than the 10th percentile or AC less than the, per, per, uh, the 10th percentile. So in our group, and everybody, everybody, everybody's group is a little bit different as to what their protocol is, but in our group, even if the estimated fetal weight is like the 12th, 13th percentile, if that AC is less than the 10th percentile, then we're going to start Doppler evaluation. 
All right, and we usually are going to follow on, you know, usually uh, once to three times a week, depending upon what else is going on with them. Late changes would be your venous Dopplers, great debate as to when you need to bring them back. But we're looking at the heart rate tracing and the BPP. So your biophysical profile, four components are done with ultrasound. The fifth component is done with a non-stress test. Because just like, you know, when the baby's born, you do an APGAR, we're trying to do an in utero APGAR. So we're looking at movement, tone, practice breathing movements, and then how much is the, how much is the fluid around the baby. So we try to re we're starting to rely more and more on the Doppler because when you wait for the changes in your BPP, you have uh, increased risk for stillbirth. So we're trying to get these babies delivered before we, um, we see changes in the BPP. So that's where the Doppler really helps. <clears throat> it's important to remember that um, IUGR uh, remote from delivery, there's severe IUGR, IUGR due to placental dysfunction. It's progressive, and there's really no treatment to reverse or halt the process. Uh, the timing, we want to um, deliver the baby when it's still, you know, we want to let them continue in the pregnancy as, as long as they can. Uh, but we, we're always on that tightrope as to when do you deliver because you have to look at the prematurity and looking at the lung development. So the timing is a big issue. So the Doppler really helps us evaluate when we need to say, okay, that's it, we need to deliver. So objectives is to buy some time, get more time for the pregnancy, to reduce the prematurity risk, but deliver that prior to the, um, the baby having uh, damage to the organs or ending up in a stillbirth. So... And late gestation, it's also important to remember that the normal umbilical artery Doppler is common in IUGR is, as the fetus gets into the later gestation. We don't know why, but we know that you can have abnormal Dopplers the whole time in this baby that's been IUGR, and about 34, 35 weeks, the Dopplers start to look normal. Well, that baby's still at risk, and you're still following them, but your Dopplers are not as helpful after 34 weeks. So there's sequential deterioration is rare in fetuses beyond 32 to 34 weeks, and there's that article on that. So when you're looking at the fetal surveillance, the risk of fetal distress is 86% when both the umbilical and the MCA Dopplers are abnormal. So, I mean, this is pretty powerful. I mean, when you're picking up that this baby has an 86% risk for a problem based on these Dopplers, that's pretty powerful. And what we're really looking for is if they're normal, that it decreases our risk for fetal distress to about 4% when both them, the Dopplers are normal. So what does our OB Doppler tell us? Well, when you're looking at the MCA and the umbilical artery RI, it's 70% diagnostic accuracy. If you're looking at abnormal MCA, about 54% diagnostic accuracy. But when you're looking at abnormal umbilical artery alone, about 66. So it's a combination of looking at both the MCA and the umbilical that's gonna give us a little bit higher accuracy. And what is it doing? It's helping us to prevent these adverse outcomes, the uh, C-section, low APGAR, and I see you admissions and then need natal complications. So what does the OB Doppler tell us? It helps us to decide how to plan the care for the remainder of the pregnancy, how often are we doing testing, and when is it time to get that baby out of there? So again, we have photos from uh, Dr. Gaziano. I just wanna say special thanks to him. I mean, if you ever look at any of the original Doppler work, he's done a lot of it. Uh, he's been one of my mentors for the past 17 years and I always just like give him kudos for that. And he also has a free website for people to look at. It's called obimages.net, where he will let you go on there and look at different things, all different parts of the babies. Give you images, giving you what else to look for. So it's a nice, good, free website for you guys to look at. And that's the Doppler. <laughs> <laughs>